All right, well, thank you guys for the congratulations. Hello, and since this is Montreal, bonjour. <laughs> um, I'm Lauren Milne, and I'm going to be talking about the work I did with my advisor, Richard Ladner, on Blocks for All, on overcoming accessibility barriers to blocks programming for children with visual impairments. Um, and that's a long title, so what exactly do I mean by blocks programming? Uh, so blocks programming um, is this relatively uh, new um, uh, uh, environment that are used to uh, introduce children to code. Um, and in these environments, you drag and drop puzzle-like units of code from a menu, or uh, I'll call it toolbox throughout the talk, to a workspace. So this is an example. This is a program that will um, print out Hello World three times. And there's a lot of reasons, uh, which I won't get into, that these are easier for young programmers. Um, and they've become very popular in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. Um, so for example, on code.org, almost all of the freely available curriculum that's um, centered for um, primary and uh, school learners use these block-based languages. Um, and the majority of the hour of code um, activities use these block-based environments. Uh, currently, unfortunately, they're not very accessible for children with visual impairments. Uh, so if you want to use this curriculum in your classroom and you're a mainstream teacher and you maybe have a child with a visual impairment in your classroom, um, you're not going to be able to use this curriculum for all the students in your classroom. And this, of course, sends a message to the, the children with visual impairments uh, that maybe computer science isn't for you, maybe programming isn't for you. Uh, so we wanted to address this problem and come up with techniques to make these environments more accessible uh, for children with visual impairments. So our first uh, step in this research was to answer what are the accessibility barriers in existing blocks based in programming environments for children with visual impairments. So in order to answer this, we evaluated nine different environments. Five of them were um, web-based and five or four of them were um, based on mobile devices. And we evaluated them with a screen reader, which is a tool that you can use to um, navigate around on a computer or a, a touch screen device. And it will read aloud um, whatever element is selected. So you can use it to navigate uh, if you have a visual impairment. And there's a lot more detail on, these, on this evaluation in the paper. I'm not going to go into it too much. Um, but I will say what we found was that there were five main accessibility barriers to using these environments. The first was in accessing the output of the actual um, programs that you created. So a lot of them had like visual avatars that you could animate with your programs. Um, but of course, if you can't see the visual avatar, uh, it's not going to be very exciting to write a program to animate them. Uh, the second accessibility barrier we found was in accessing the actual elements. So um, in the majority of these environments, the screen reader couldn't even uh, read what the blocks were. Uh, so of course, you wouldn't be able to build or understand a program if you're using a screen reader. Uh, the third main barrier was in actually moving the blocks. So in order to create the program, you in the majority of these environments, you had to use uh, drag and drop. Uh, <coughs> And it's, you can't really use drag and drop if you have a screen reader, because even if you're able to perform the gesture, you can't tell where you are um, placing an item. It's, it's very visual. Um, and then there are uh, two more, slightly more subtle barriers. One was that screen readers weren't able to convey the program structure for a lot of these environments. So here I have a picture of the repeat uh, three times loop. Um, and inside a repeat loop are the blocks that are actually going to be repeated. So it's really important in programming to know if something is inside of a loop or outside of it, because if it's outside the loop, it won't be repeated. If it's inside, it will. Um, and with screen readers, even in, um, if you're able to access the elements and read what the blocks are, uh, there weren't indications about um, whether a block was still in a repeat or if you'd exited a repeat. Um, and then the final barrier we found was that a lot of these block-based environments uh, convey a lot of really rich information in the shapes of the blocks. Um, so they convey certain types of type information about the blocks. So example, for example, in this repeat wall uh, loop, it has a condition, uh, count less than or equal to three. 
Um, and the, it, it's the condition count less than or equal to three is a Boolean condition it evaluates to true or false. Um, and you can tell sort of that it's a Boolean condition because it has a certain puzzle piece like shape that, that indicates that it will fit into the repeat while block. Um, and of course this is conveyed through the shape of the block so you don't get that sort of information if you use a screen reader. Um, so, uh, I'll go into more depth um, on these accessibility barriers to talk about how we uh, decided to try and mitigate them. Um, and our, our next question was really, what are the interactions um, that we can, can we use to overcome these barriers and make these environments accessible for children with visual impairments? Um, so to answer this, uh, we did a design exploration. We worked with uh, one teacher of the visually impaired and five children with visual impairments. And we worked with uh, children with a wide range of visual impairments. So two of these um, children were exclusively used at screen reader with our, our study and really did not have much sight. The other three um, had some sight and preferred to, to use it when possible. Um, and we used <coughs> an a iPad um, for a number of reasons. Um, but uh, it works really well with a screen reader. Um, and it's, it was really popular. It turns out all of the children in our study had some experience using an iPad, which is excellent. Um, and we also used a, a Dash robot, which is a fun little robot. Um, and it sort of took care of that accessing output program because even the children who were completely blind were able to tell what the robot was doing by simply feeling the robot. It turned out it was really popular. The, the kids loved working with the robot. Um, and we tried out a bunch of different uh, variations um, with the children, and we worked with the kids from um, one to four sessions, um, just trying out the different techniques and getting feedback and sort of improving our design. Um, as I said, we, we tried a bunch of different variations. In the interest of time, I'm just going to um, go through and, and talk about uh, sort of the final design we landed on and the things we learned doing this development. Um, and once again, I, I won't go through all three of the accessibility barriers we found. I'll talk about three of them. Uh, so the first is actually accessing the elements, so uh, making sure the blocks themselves are accessible. Uh, the second is the approaches we took to actually moving the blocks and creating the program. And then the third one is um, what we looked at. It conveying some of this type information that is normally conveyed through the shape and um, possibly the color of the block. All right, so for the first, uh, the first step was actually making sure that they, the children could access the different blocks. Um, so we, used, we ended up using high contrast icons um, so that they, were, um, they could work uh, possibly better for, for children with low vision. Uh, this turned out to be really good for some of the um, kids in our study. They weren't able to focus very well and they, and they weren't able to read the text on normal blocks, but they could distinguish um, to someone to read the different shapes um, on our icon place blocks. We also made the blocks resizable so that the, the children could make the blocks bigger. And this uh, turned out to be really useful. A lot of the children with low vision in our study didn't like using the traditional magnifiers on the um, iPad because they would lose sense of the context of where they were in the program and just get the, the details. And when we made the blocks resizable, they still had an idea of what the rest of the um, uh, interface looked like, and it was just the blocks that were um, bigger so they could get detail on it. Uh, for the kids that were blind, of course, we wanted to make sure that it worked well with the screen reader. Um, so we um, added information for the screen reader uh, to make it usable. Uh, the first piece of information was what the block actually was. So this is a make elephant noise block. Then we had information about where the block was, so block two of three in the workspace, uh, what type of block it is, operation. Um, and then how to move it as a hint. So you can double tap to, to move this block. Uh, another important thing we, we learned pretty early on is that we needed to move all the blocks to the bottom of the screen. So typically in these block-based environments, the blocks are kind of just floating um, in the middle of the screen. And it turned out this was really difficult for the children with uh, no vision to find with the screen reader. Um, so we moved it to the bottom of the screen so that they were able, easily able to, to find the blocks. Um, so the second thing we really looked at was, was actually moving the blocks. Um, so traditionally in these environments, as I mentioned before, uh, they use drag and drop. So you drag and, and drop your block wherever you want it to go. 
And we were really interested in exploring about if there's a way to make this uh, drag and drop uh, work for the children, um, maybe provide audio directions. Um, but it turned out this did not work well <laughs> for, for the children in the study. Um, for the kids with low vision, they actually had some difficulty with the drag and drop because they, a lot of them are holding the iPad so close to their face that it was hard for them uh, to hold it that close and do uh, the dragging. And uh, for the children who didn't have any vision, uh, it was really hard to do even an audio guided drag and drop because the audio directions took sort of too long uh, to, to get to them for them to be able to um, respond in time. So the, the gesture was a little too fast for the, the type of response they got. So what we ended up doing was a version of select, select, drop. Um, so this is a, a video of me doing it. And you'll see me, I'll select a block. It's the make goat noise um, from the toolbox on the side of the screen by double tapping. And after I select the block, the program is going to switch state into like a block selected state. And so the toolbox will be replaced with the block that I selected um, and information about that. Um, and then you'll see I'll, I'll uh, look around in the workspace, uh, read the program, and determine where I want to place the block. And then I'll double tap to place it. Make croc, make goat noise. Make goat noise selected. Place make goat noise. If place make goat noise before and if. Place make goat noise before repeat. Inside repeat. Place make goat noise before and repeat. Workspace block, make goat noise. Excellent. So now my robot will make goat noise in addition to some other things. <laughs> um, and uh, that was me doing it. Of course, I'm a sighted adult. Uh, so here's actually a participant um, who is a, a screen reader user. And you'll see that she is going to select the random noise block uh, by, by double tapping. And then she will place it in the workspace and double tap again to, to place it there. Button. Make random noise. In toolbox. Double tap to place block in workspace. Make random noise selected. Select location in workspace to place it. Place make random noise before wiggle. Workspace block four of four. Double tap. To make random noise. In toolbox. Double tap to place block in workspace. Play. Button. So you can see she's actually just feeling the robot to see what he's doing um, and understand the output. Um, so then the final uh, thing we looked at was how to, if there are different ways to convey the type information that's really conveyed with the um, shape and color in typical block space environments. Um, so in this prototype environment, I explored using three different types of blocks. So I had, this is a, a repeat uh, two times uh, block and inside it there's a make dinosaur noise and then he'll repeat three times make goat noise. Um, the three different top types of blocks that I used, we had number blocks which modified repeat loops so you could repeat a certain number of times. Um, we also had conditional blocks so I think uh, if the robot heard a noise it was an example of the condition block and that would modify um, an if statement and then we had just the standard operations like make dinosaur noise. And so we um, chose to try and display this both through shape and color, like a traditional block space environment. Um, so uh, you can see that the, um, the numbers here have a, a red square on the bottom to indicate they fit with the repeat loop. Um, and we also tried to convey this through audio. So if you're using a screen reader, um, the numbers will make a high-pitched beep beep noise uh, that matches a high-pitched beep beep noise that the um, repeat loops make so that you uh, kind of get an idea that they'll fit together. And then the conditional statements and the conditions um, make a lower pitched boop boop noise. Um, and you'll see that in the, the video, it's slightly better than me uh, making up what that sounds. So in this video, you're going to see me select the two times uh, block from the menu and you'll hear it go beep beep. And then I'll search through the workspace looking for a um, repeat block that makes the same noise. You also hear in this version that um, I actually explicitly tell you that the blocks can't fit in certain places. Um, and so you'll also, I think, hear um, some boop boops for the if statements. Control category selected if three times, two times, if two, two repeat, two times, two cannot place and make elephant noise, cannot place an if, cannot, pl cannot place an end if. Place two times as number of times repeat. Two times. In toolbox. Du 
Um, and once again, here's another participant who is also a, a screen reader um, and doesn't have vision. And you'll see um, he's going to select the hear voice condition um, and he'll place it as the condition for an if statement. Toolbox, two times. Air toolbox, three. Obstacle in front. Obstacle in front. Hear voice. Hear voice inside if. Place hear voice as condition of if. Workspace block one. Hear voice. Um, so this was great. I had the children try out a number of different interfaces with the, the tasks um, and, and found that the, the children were actually able to, to do this, which was really exciting. Um, and the children were able to use, um, use our final interface and had a lot of fun programming the robot. Uh, we collected some quantitative data and, and Likert scores, but I think the success is probably best expressed by the children and themselves. So. <laughs> I did that. Oh my goodness. I did that. <laughs> I, if I didn't know any better, I was, I was, I think you were having fun. Yeah, I am. Okay. Um, so this was, was awesome. Basically, we show that there are ways that we can make these block-based environments um, accessible to children with, with visual impairments. Um, so, <clears throat> hopefully in the future, people will start doing that so that actually all of this curriculum will be accessible. Um, so if you'd like to try a beta version of this um, application, just send me an email and I'll add you to test flight. Um, and let me know if you have any questions or thoughts. Thanks. Thank you. Questions? Everyone's ready for uh, lunch. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. So uh, you identified these uh, challenges for, um, so these challenges in future. Uh, should we develop um, accessible block-based programming languages, or do you think we should create technologies to you, kind of enhance existing techno existing block-based technologies to you, you know, accommodate or make it accessible? That's a great question. Um, so his question was, well, actually you guys could probably hear that, was if we should um, sort of make new blocks-based um, environments or if we could maybe enhance existing ones. And really my hope was that we'd, we would be able to use this work to enhance existing ones. I, I don't necessarily like the idea of separate but equal um, curriculum for these students. Uh, and I think I really tried to explore enhancements that would be able to be built into existing block space languages. Cool. Uh, hi, I'm Kelly Mack from the University of Illinois and wonderful talk, like I love this whole project. So um, I was just curious, uh, did any of the children have any issues kind of remembering the overall structure of the code? Uh, was there any kind of like playback what I have written type of things so they could figure out where to insert things to? Yeah, that's a great question. She was, she was wondering if uh, the children were able to remember the, the overall structure. Um, and actually, that was, that was one reason we decided to use the touch screen, was that children would be able to go back and reference the structure. And they would also have some sort of spatial knowledge about where the different blocks were. And we actually had one of our, one of our children who, had, um, who used a screen reader and didn't have vision um, noted that he really liked being able to directly place a block, like. In a, in a location that he knew he didn't have to um, swipe through the program. That's a good question. One more question. Um, hi, David Weintraub from University of Maryland. Um, I want to echo the sentiments. I thought this was a fantastic talk, a really neat project. Um, my question is, as someone who's interested in designing these types of environments broadly, what are, what are the, what's the low-hanging fruit in terms of taking existing languages and adding little features here or there that would start to make them more accessible to visually impaired learners? <laughs> Great question. I think the lowest hanging fruit is definitely making sure that the blocks are actually con convey some of the information to the screen reader. Um, I think, so I'll go back to um, a slide talking about the barriers. Um, I think that is relatively easy. And of course, changing some of the output or incorporating more audio output would be relatively easy. Um, I think for the, the drag and drop, that could take a little bit more work, but certainly being able to, to make an environment use select, select, drop a slightly different paradigm would also be really useful for children with motor impairments. Um, I think the more uh, challenging things I found, one of them was that um, children with visual impairments couldn't find like the floating blocks in the middle of the screen. And so I think with existing pro 
um, environments that could be more challenging to implement so that it's placed on the bottom of the screen. It also limits you to one stack of blocks. So in a lot of the existing environments, you can have like multiple um, sort of threads of blocks um, that, that run in parallel, or you can just have blocks kind of floating around in your workspace. Um, and it, you're certainly limited if you're trying to, to place them in a specific location on the screen. Great. Thank you. All right, let's thank Lauren one more.